biggest challenge when it comes to the country's economy since the 1980s. As a result, our focus this evening is on the possible impact of the coronavirus outbreak on the Ghanaian economy. What could be those impacts? Is it impacting the country's economy negatively? How about many of you talking about the need to lock down the Ghanaian economy? This evening, we ask very critical questions. What happens in the event of a lockdown on many of the Ghanaian population who are living in the poverty bracket? Can they actually stand the two weeks lockdown or maybe three weeks lockdown and possibly four weeks lockdown? But before we get into this very conversation, it's important we understand the figures behind the Ghanaian economy. And so let's get into the 2020 budget and find out some of the figures. So as you can see, total revenue and grants for 2020 is 67 billion Ghana cities and total expenditure is projected at 85 billion. Now talking about expenditure, let's get into the breakdown of the expenditure and you would see that compensation of employees is at 26.5 billion. Interest payments on our debt is 21.6 billion and then capital expenditure that is spending on infrastructure development and others is at 9.2 billion. Goods and services has its share of 8.3 billion and then statutory government transfers is at 15 billion and finally other expenditure at 2.6 billion. But it's also important that we look at uh, you know the breakdown of revenue. So where are we getting all our revenue from? And as you can see, tax revenue is at 49.2 billion. Now of the tax revenue you can see import duties, that's international trade, 5.8 billion. Now, in these times, we will be finding out, for instance, how that is going to be affected. And then non-tax revenue, according to the 2020 budget, is at 13.1 billion. And then oil revenue, which is part of non-tax revenue, is at 4.6 billion, with other revenue accounting for 2.8 billion. So when we return after the break, we'll be seated, I'll be introducing my guest, and then we get into the conversation of how coronavirus is affecting the Ghanaian economy. My name, as Winston Amwa, and we'll be right back after the break. All right, so welcome back from that short break, and thank you very much for staying with us. This is our front on Joy News, and my guest this evening is a former finance minister, Seth Tepe. Good evening, and thank you very much for joining us. Good evening, and uh, good evening to uh, the viewers and to listeners as well. I, I, I believe you're doing very well, and the economy is treating you very well. <laughs> I'm doing well, but it's good. We are surviving. You're economy. surviving? Yes. Yeah. When you say you're surviving, what should the ordinary Ghanaian do then? Well, we're managing. I prefer the word manage because whether you're rich or poor, under the current circumstances, you have to manage your resources. Under the current <coughs> circumstances. Yeah. What is it about the current circumstances that would warrant you having to manage your resources? That wasn't the case previously. No, I don't want to sound alarmist, but the point is that we all know that there is um, an issue at stake, a global health issue at stake with a lot of warning. We have seen even the advanced countries and many strong middle-income countries taking extraordinary measures, uh, including, you know, um, initially it was <coughs> um, limiting the number of hours that, you know, people would have to work, um, demand going down all of a sudden, crude air prices going down, affecting businesses, employment. Mm. Uh, and so under those circumstances, obviously, as we have seen in the past, you know, you begin to appreciate that, you know, the conditions, you know, are different. The times so, are so, so different. you think you're beginning to feel <laughs> the impact of the coronavirus already? Let me put it this way, for my, since we are talking about the economy. Yes. Um, I lived through this. I lived through this when the crude oil, you know, prices fell uh, back in 2014 uh, through 2016. And the impact that it had on the economy you live through this when the economy goes through uh, hiccups, such as the disruption in gas supply, you know, from Nigeria, which um, was summarized in one word, doom so, which took two and a half years. And the fact that uh, VR, uh, VRA and others had to buy crude, very expensive, before, you know, Chua came on, on, on board to save the situation. 
So I'm saying that <clears throat> as somebody who has been, you know, part of, you know, President Mahama and uh, from uh, the late President Mercy's administration, uh, we have seen setbacks to the economy. In so talking countries. about yes, talking about setbacks to the economy and having lived through this, you'll be one person who certainly would understand it. So let's get <coughs> to the Ghanaian situation. Later on, on the show, we'll get to your living through the 2014 to 2016 period and how you actually solved it. But you've talked about you being affected, many of us being affected. Let's situate it properly. How do you think the outbreak of coronavirus is affecting the Ghanaian economy? You, you have to link it to what is happening globally. Mm. It's very, very important because what happens is, um, let's take the genesis. <clears throat> the first thing that happened, you know, was corona came up, coronavirus in China, Wuhan. And then we saw the Chinese government take very, very severe and drastic measures to control it. Because remember, they have experience with SARS, you know, and other, you know, uh, fatalities which affected their economy, uh, including the 2014 era which I was talking about. So uh, they took those measures and immediately it disrupted the supply chain, the supply chain. And when you, China is the second largest economy, it is the production hub for the globe. And so back then, you would have heard Apple and others saying their supply lines from sure. China are getting shut. And when that happens, then the immediate thing that happens is that demand and employment begins to go slow down in the advanced world. And when demand, that is demand for services, demand for goods, and in this case, the supply it used to be just demand, the supply is also affected, then that is when the contagion effects you know, begins, and that is, they buy our cocoa, they buy our crude oil. And then immediately following that, OPEC started the discussions, and the war is still on between Saudi Arabia and Russia, and then crude oil prices collapse. So you can see the general effect in demand for our commodities slowing down, but then the more direct effect on, say, the petroleum revenues, which is one of the solid bases now, also going down as a result of crude oil prices okay. going down. So this is how, you know, global events and developments, you know. So, so, so let's look at the global events and developments. <coughs> and you've talked about, uh, you know, demand for our commodities, say, such as cocoa and others, naturally would slow down because many of these people are not manufacturing. And also a reduction in crude oil prices. We budgeted, uh, you know, in the budget about $62, we're moving uh, less than $30. Now that's about a 50% reduction. So clearly that would indicate that we will not be gaining the uh, $4.6 billion that we budgeted for in the 2020 budget. But how is that likely to affect the Ghanaian economy? Well, we have an experience. <laughs> we have what, what, what experience? We have it. Uh, in 2014, we actually did a budget in 2014, November. Mm -hmm at a price of $99 per sure. barrel. Back then, the crude oil price was very high, right? Um, even before we finished reading the budget, the, what we call the BRICS, you know, Brazil, you know, Russia, India, and China began to melt, mm -hmm. you know, um, <clears throat> melt in the sense of uh, the same factors we are talking about, demand falling, and then it affected the advanced economies. And by March, you know, when cabinets authorized me to go to parliament, crude oil prices had dropped initially below $40 uh, to about $35, then it rose. And it never rose above $43. Even when we did a budget with $53, you know, dollars, the 2015 and 20, 2016, 2015, 2016 budgets, we did it hoping that prices were going to go up. That was a forecast and everything at about $50, $56. It didn't. And so we kept in the 40s. And mm -hmm. so oil revenue slumped. You know, it affected the budget. We had to trim. You, you know, had to the trim budget. what specifically? Well, let, me, let, me give the you, budget. No, let me give you one mm -hmm. very specific sure. example. You will remember that during the campaign in 2016, President Mahama said we were not going to do the 200, you know, free SHS groups. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that manifesto said, you know, and then he also said we were going to do 120, but finish 80 for, for certain. This was a direct effect of those revenues taking a hit, and we having to reprioritize because we went to parliament twice. 
So in, in, in so, 2015 in, so, and in 2016. So in effect, you had to revise <laughs> the budget. You we had did. To, you had to, sh you know, uh, shelve certain projects that you had. Uh, Absolutely, uh, in, I gave you one. Of doing. Yes, we, we 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 had to we had to reduce expenditures drastically, and many, you know, remember we were just coming out of doom so, you know, also, uh, and so it took a hit, um, but. Um, <clears throat> the, 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 I want to use the word right, appropriate word. The sad thing is that, you know, back then these were happening, but a lot of what was happening was being blamed on non-performance by the government, mm. you know, and therefore uh, there are lessons that we can pick, you know, from, from the, if this prolongs, because remember the crude oil prices that fell in 2014, you know, were late 2014 after the budget did not increase until 2017 when it crept back into the 50s then you know uh, into 53 and then uh, it hit 83 at a point but then had been hovering around 63. Mm -hmm. um, we were also lucky in a sense if you remember uh, to have had Tenfield and Sankofa coming on stream you know due to the investments that were made and so between 2017-2018 uh, the revenue, which was below one billion, shot up to about four billion, and okay. so that's you know today. Um, uh, crude output, which was around seventy thousand or less. Remember, we had a tariff bearing issues for Jubilee, which was only one field, which was about seventy thousand, increased to nearly one hundred and ninety thousand. That is the output, and the price also rebound. So we had it good. The question which I have, which I have been posting in my the second article, which you have reviewed is whether we could have learned more lessons, especially with respect to how we structured. You we'll, know, get to, the, we'll get to yes. how, I mean, whether we could have learned more lessons. From the way revenue, yes. yes <coughs> but I'm saying, OK, then in short, mm. I'm saying that we have been through these episodes, especially when, remember from um, you know, coming out of the 1970s to the 80s, I was a public servant back then. The economy was tough. You know, we had to go through GRP, SAP, under Dr. Butchway. Uh, just when things were improving, we had the bushfires, which affected, you know, uh, Kuku, mm. you know, uh, there were periods when we had drought, okay? I mean, every president has had one, you know, or the other, and it is that which informed the fact that probably we should use the oil revenue in a different way than we had used gold, you know, Kuku. Okay, so talking about the fact that, you know, in, in your time when it happened, you, you, you were seen as non-performing, and you haven't lived through it, clearly. What is happening now is not something you would blame on non-performance, would you? I wouldn't blame it entirely on non-performance, but I would also say that, you know, we had good times. And for me, I take issue with some of the measures that were taken. What were those you measures know? that you take issue with? Well, I think I, I did, you know... Yes, but for, I mean, for those who haven't read the article, <laughs> what are those I mean, measures that you have issues with? One, <clears throat> it became clear that you know, we were keen to show the world that we were doing well. And so even though we started a bailout, it was delayed, we did, and we enacted ESLA, which itself told you, and remember we enacted ESLA in November 2015, going into the 2016 election year. That's a very bold thing to do, to increase. By the time we were leaving office, ESLA was generating some money, and we had started actually the banking sector restructuring with the revenue that was coming in. So we knew the banking sector, for example, had issues. And it came from the energy sector. Okay. Because we did the first refinancing. You can look at the first, you can look at the 2017 budget. There was no provision for energy sector costs, and there was no provision for bailout costs, even though bailout had been done. Right? Mm -hmm. Then by 2018, when we started paying the bailout costs, we started excluding it and showing a rosy. You know, picture. When you say we started excluding it, what do you mean? Well, you know, in, in, the, in the budget, you have revenue, you just showed it, and you have expenditure, and when you deduct the two, it's just like a household. You have income, and you have expenditure. Mm -hmm. if, you are, if, if you are low income or living beyond your means, then it means that your expenditure often is higher than your income. Okay. And, then you, and sorry, then you get to a deficit, mm -hmm. right? There will be exceptional cases all the time maybe from childbirth to death to sickness. I'm looking at households, sure. which are not normal expenditure like food and the rest. Business is the same. 
you just refurbished it since I was here the last time. <laughs> that is not an expenditure like your salary, which is paid you know, regularly. The same with nations. Exceptional circumstances come, and some of them bring in revenue, like HIPIC, mm -hmm. you know, bushfires, I mentioned it, uh, single spine, and all those things. And our disclosure, fiscal disclosure requirements are that, yes, you show the normal, but you add the exceptional to give Ghanaians a true picture of the economy. So in effect, you're saying that the government has not been painting a true <coughs> picture of the Ghanaian Well, we have, we have pointed that out. I would, let me just say that, you know, we, we differed on the way, you know, they showed the fiscal because um, uh, it was different from what other governments had done. And so people ask, you know, but it's exceptional. It's not going to be repeated. So you're unhappy with the exclusion of the bailout cost, for instance, from many, I mean, from the fiscal deficit figures. So uh, I am saying, I'm saying that it gave a rosier picture, right? And if we had included it right today, mm -hmm. the IMF would not go back and add it to the deficit. But talking about, right. let me just get, take you to one thing. You, you, you talked about how it will look at, you know, uh, your time. You came up with the ESLA. And also, you knew that a banking and sector... And we cut it, Yes, you knew that a banking sector had issues. And so, if anybody blames you for having played a role in the banking sector crisis, that person shouldn't be wrong, should it? No, that's a blame game. It's the same as saying that if... Would you say, would you blame the current government for not making a provision? Would you Is it because that? I was... No, I'm asking a question. Is it... <laughs> is it because and is I, and it I'm because throwing it back to you? Would you no, I am, no, I am saying that. Look, I think that we should look at you know the facts. Mm. Let me say the facts. You had doom so, right? You had businesses that were operating at half cost with generators and everything. The economy was going through a lot of stress. Remember, the economy was also suffering from the global financial crisis, and I just spoke about the brick induced crisis. <clears throat> Crude oil prices fell. And remember, even though we did 3.6% at the end of 2016, South Africa went into recession, Nigeria went into recession, Angola went into recession, Zambia, many countries went into recession. Ghana did not go into recession because of the measures that we took. Okay. But coming to the banking sector, if a, bank, if a business goes for a loan, we talk about VRA. We did extra because of the because we didn't we couldn't increase you know crude oil prices to the fullest extent you know of petrol prices which we later liberalized. So if a business is operating half strength one quarter due to doom so and others, right, due to external factors as we are seeing Corona, right, mm -hmm. and they go and take a loan and they are unable to pay, or VRA goes to take a loan and is unable to pay. I think the perception that we paid money to shareholders, you know, who wasted it. Let me correct it now. The ESNA payments, which was the bulk of payments that we made to the 13 banks, were loans which VRA had taken. They were no shareholder funds. And those loans were from shareholder, uh, sorry, from deposits, the deposits that we are. So they were not. You know, if you look at the balance sheet, if you claim that the banks were in very, you know, horrid condition, mm. right? Obviously, it means that they had depleted so, 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 in effect, you, you wouldn't want to engage <coughs> the blame game. Government is no, I don't want to engage in the you, blame game. You inherit game. everything. No, and I'm saying that today, businesses are suffering. Mm. Today, so, the banks are going so to let's suffer. Let's look at businesses yes. suffering. So, let's okay. rather learn yes. from the Let's learn from the lessons. You yes. introduced ESLA at yes. that time. Yes. That was a way of generating revenue. Should the government be thinking of maybe bringing back some of the taxes just to ensure they're able to get more revenue at the time when we are faced with a reduction in revenue? Let me give you two examples. <coughs> we introduced ESLA, and I'm quoting from the ESLA report. Mm -hmm. by, 20, by the time the 2018 ESLA report was published, ESLA was, and I said 2018, ESLA was going to generate 28 billion Ghana cities by 2022. 28 billion. Okay. We have since increased ESLA, which means that 
that revenue could top 30 billion. If the banking sector crisis, as we are told, is 15 billion, and it is related to, bank, to energy, and it's related to contractors, because those are the two key elements, enhanced road levy, and you know, enhanced, enhanced road levy, and the energy sector levy, that are the two components, right? That's about half of the revenue to be expected. Where did the rest of the money go? We need an accounting for this before we talk about increasing revenue. Temporary taxes, they were introduced during the Rawlings era, they were introduced during the Kufu era, they were introduced in Mills, and they were introduced during the Mahama era. Of course, we deferred it for another year. And the thing about temporary taxes is that when the economy is in stress, as we are today, you introduce it, and then you take it off when the times are good. So I just said that in 2018, for example, 2017, you know, we saw Tenfield, we saw Sankofa, right? And I had an introduction. Yes, in the past, it, we may be in West Ham since, you know, 85. Well, that's, you know, but <laughs> this government is also the one that came, you know, and inherited a lot of revenue. Exactly. It generated, mm -hmm. you know, so the point I'm making is why were the, the temporary taxes not taken off? Because when times were good was when we could have taken them off. And today, there was if you ask me though. today, we reduce them. The yeah, they were supposed to go. Also reduce them too. Well, they, but they return, I'm saying that compared, yeah, so, so there was also I'm saying compared to other crises, mm -hmm. compared to other crises, none of the governments you, we're talking about, in, except for HIPIC, inherited such significant. Okay. And so I'm saying that I would have answered readily, yes, if those temporary taxes had been gone away, then one of the tools I would have suggested was, you know, maybe temporary taxes until we get it. But then, on top of ESLA, on top of oil revenue, and on top of virus, you know, it was maintained. Yeah, but we are faced with a situation so, now. You've just explained to us. We are faced with a situation <coughs> now where petroleum revenue, all things being equal, is going to be re reduced by half. We've reached a situation where the import duties that I showed, uh, 5.8 billion that we budgeted for import duties, we're, we're not going to half them. Even non-tax revenue, so some would have reductions in them. Under the circumstances, can't we learn from what you did and say, temporarily, let's introduce certain taxes. Let's increase certain taxes on our set tech way. Could we have learned? Would be my question. Could we have learned when we're not using the sinking fund to reduce debts, as we did with one oil field? with crude oil prices low, could we have learned? Could we have learned when we were using part of the ABFA for consumption hmm. and not doing the investments that we had to do? Could we have learned, you know, in putting money in the contingency fund? Remember, even 2015, 2016, when we introduced the, the contingency fund, when crude prices were going down, it is a constitutional mandate since 20, uh, um, a constitutional mandate from the uh, 1992 constitution. We started it. We had about 80 or 90, you know, a self correction in the contingency fund, which was part of the oil revenue. The first use of the contingency fund was, that was the first relief funds that went, mm. you know, with the Kwame Nkrumah uh, circle uh, fire and flood disaster, right? It has not been replenished. Great. So, so could we? I'm saying so, that so yes. Before, mm -hmm. I, yes, I, 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 I do appreciate that we are in difficult times, mm -hmm. and I would be the last person to say that fiscal measures are not required. So, just what fiscal measures similar are required? To, similar well, to the ones you uh, uh, well, instituted? Just, I think we just um, which ones? The temporary taxes I explained. Yes. That I wasn't just the only one to use it. I'm saying the can can that be used now? Well, that would mean restoring probably what you know, but not fully, because remember it hasn't been taken off fully and it has been mainstreamed. So when we are talking about revenues going down, it means that we have virtually compromised, you know, one of you know the handlers that would, right? But I just I heard the president. I think that they have capable people. 
You know, no question about it. They just had the president saying that they're going to come out, you know, with the, you know, um, they are listening and they would come out, you know, uh, after evaluating the economic responses. Yes, but your, your, I think Bank of Ghana has reduced interest rates, just like some yes. other, yes, some of that. So let me acknowledge that some of those measures, you know, have been taken. Uh, I also heard about some relief. You see them as good measures? Said, we are in hard times. Are they good measures? In looking at interest rate, of course, the advanced countries are doing it. So, yes. So, so it's a step in the right I'm direction. I'm saying that, yeah, I'm, I'm saying, well, what are the tools? The tools available to you are the monetary, right? Which Bank of Ghana leads and then the fiscal. And they reduce the primary reserve also from 10 to 8 percent. Those are all, yes. You know, whether those they are, whether those they are all good measures. Them, well, we use them, and the advanced countries are using them. So they are good measures. And then they, those are the measures which are standard measures. I'm mm -hmm. talking also about the fiscal measures and what we could have done. Right? So, so, so these are things we could have done. Let's look at things we can do now. And let's learn lessons from what you did. And so if it was good for you at the time to you know, um, introduce ESLA, uh, and you, uh, you reduce it at a point in time, a new government comes in, uh, there's been reductions, can the government look at it and say, in the meantime, since you know, we're looking at uh, petroleum revenue going down and all of that, maybe we can increase it a little bit. And you, as a technocrat, having been finance minister before, can appreciate that that wouldn't be bad. Is that something you would support and say, good, the government should go ahead and do it? Well, there are, you know, it should be a comprehensive measure. You should look at the expenditure. And what would constitute should, that just, comprehensive you know, measure? I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one example. That my boss, at the time, was bold enough to say, yes, 200 you know, schools is what we promised. But the condition at the time, and it was berated for it, the conditions at the time do not justify, you know, our doing 200 schools. He said 120, and he, he didn't add a proviso. And he said, I can say for certain that we'll do, you know, 80. And he was said to have failed, you know, with the annual his promises. So that is one, boldness in looking at the spending. So you want government and to I, shelve some <coughs> of its projects? Some I'm not, I'm not the one to tell government. I have written. No, we're having the know, conversation. We're yes, having the yes. conversation. Yeah, okay. Do you want government to shelve some of their plans? What do I want for Ghana? Yes. What do I so, want? Because I don't want the issue yeah, so to be passed. What do you want for Ghana? Yes. So that's why I said that, you know, certain, certain measures were taken, which were appeared to me to be hastily. One, let us come clean and say that. The bailout costs, which were taken out, even an institution like the IMF disagrees. The deficit is not 4.7, because we want to tell you realistically that the deficit is expected to be 6.4, and it was if you it was only 3.7. Yes. yes, it was only 3.7, uh, just as we added a slab. You know, there's no government which doesn't have exceptional circumstances. Yeah, so, 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 so I'm saying that I'm saying that the mm -hmm. first is, you know, let us look at. You know, before you convince Ghanaians, you must come clean. Mm. You know, with, that's the point I'm making, right? And I've written about these things. So it's not about, I've written about some of these things from 2017. I just want to set the record straight so that, you know, maybe somebody listening to me will say that where were you or whatever. I have written about them. I have written about the exit of the fact that we shouldn't, for example, be in a hurry because you need the IMF when times are bad. You don't need the IMF. You know, you don't have your chest and leave the IMF when times are good and you have three white friends and it's giving you good revenue. No, that's not when you leave the IMF. And therefore, when you're leaving, you ought to be preparing. So that itself should be. So, so. And I'm saying, so one, let us correct the fiscal, let us be transparent with respect to the true economic condition, right? Two, let us also admit that we are not talking about corona costs only. We are talking about the budget when he showed it, not making repeating 2017 and not making provision for bailout in 2020. The IMF says up to 1.2 percent will be used on bailouts, and we all know it. So the president came and said depositors should be paid, and I said I posed a question. I was among the first that where is the provision? There's no provision in the budget. 
The president has also said that 100 million, we know that the 100 million US dollars, we know that already. The minister has considered, mm. you know, that, okay. you know, so, so when we go to the all of these things, can Then Ghana, when you mm -hmm. have done all of this, then Ghanaians will feel more confident. And I, I, I am passionate about one thing, that since both administrations and all administrations have gone through this, we should revisit the rationale for the framers of the use of our petroleum funds. Remember three years ago, we were debating whether it yeah. was prudent, right, for us to save today when we have expenditure needs today, right? And some of us said the framers had every reason to say, let's put part of the money aside. And I'm glad that the minister has said that the stabilization fund yes. will be the first. That will be the first time. The first time it was used was in 2015, 2016. You used it. We used 250 yes. million. Yes, of course, but we were very open and frank. They've been but open. Remember, they've right? been open. They've indicated. No, but, but remember, no, of course we can't. You know, they've been agreeing. I don't want us to be yeah, so, so partisan so about while, it. While, while you don't want us to get into all of that, uh, yes. the, the question <laughs> I asked, you've talked about being truthful. You've talked about these figures coming out. Of course, I've seen the IMF country report on Ghana, which has talked about uh, deficit, you know, including the bailout, about 6.4%. Like yeah, the reason, but, 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 no, but, 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 but me, my question, my question is me, that, Let me give you one, one quick point. The mm -hmm. reason I'm, I'm, I'm making this point is that the IMF board met in December. Mm -hmm. The IMF board met in December. That December last year, our parliament was still debating the budget for approval for the appropriation fund, for that sort of appro yes, uh, appropriation, appropriation act. Appropriation acts, yes. Yes. And we did not disclose to parliament and to Ghanaians that we had given consent for the deficit to be revised to 7%, because no government goes, so, so the IMF wouldn't go to the board yeah, so we didn't my, give a consent. My question is, yes. <clears throat> if all these things, we've seen the IMF document, including the bailout, with all these things being acknowledged, do you think it's important for Ghana at this point to consider temporarily increasing certain taxes or maybe introducing new taxes to be able to offset the challenges in revenue? Let me be clear. Stabilization fund <clears throat> is going to be used. Um, we are hopefully going to get some financing, you know, but the revenue measures before I would say should go with expenditure measures. I'm and I'm giving the example of the past and how other governments are at to. So let us also hear about what other promises are going to be tripped. So you want Ghana. And then to let us also yes. And so, then so, so the, the question is you would want to see Ghana you know uh, shelving some a of A comprehensive its, package. A comprehensive package which includes yes. shelving some of our you know um, Developmental plans in the budget, like you did in your time. Is yeah. that something you'd so like to see? Yeah, the government can take a cue. And if they take a cue and they say, we still would want to. That's what authority is about. It may come anyway, mm. because even though the request to the IMF <coughs> is a rapid credit facility, if you read, it says it is rapid and comes with limited conditionality. Sure. You it means that it means you, that you there will be. The IMF. When it talks about limited conditionality, what does that mean? Well, in the interest of disclosure, I work for the IMF, yes. so not just consult. Yeah. Yes, you work for the IMF. I so. consulted for them, and you know. So yes. you work for the IMF. So when and it I, talks about limited conditionality, what does that mean? It's the same. It's the same conditionalities. Only, you know, they recognize that this is this uh, hard times. Countries need help. You know, and so, for example, the statement, the IMF statement has said, you know, in answer to the uh, Corona COVID-19 uh, um, uh, virus mm -hmm. issue, that governments should consider prioritizing health expenditure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a milder form of a conditionality will say what priority are given to health expenditure you know, among the expenditures. And that means that some other sectors may have to give. And we all agree. You know, it isn't that those sectors are not important. Okay. You know, so um, I, that's one example of a mild conditionality. The IMF might say, what are, you know, revenue handles? But remember that taxes are, it's not just petroleum revenues are going to go down. Businesses 
you know, are slowing down. So you may have your corporate income tax. The ports are not as busy as they, you just showed it. Import duty was the largest. Mm. You know, those yes. are also going to go down. What other, so even in the midst of the revenues going down, maybe the, the fund might say, you know, maybe you are not, and this is part of the negotiation, this is part of the mm -hmm. discussion which I, I was involved in. Fund might say, okay, fine, we, we, we do acknowledge that revenues are going down already, but could you tighten, say, administration side of GRA to make sure that, you know, there aren't, you know, too many leakages? And then limited also means that there isn't going to be a, a, a large number relatively, uh, instead of, say, seven, eight, you know, conditionalities, we may end up with three or something. Those, that's what limited. So limited means, you know, what priorities, changes are you making? And they have already indicated in their guideline to countries, you know, they are also cautioning against taking on more debt, you know, particularly for expenditures that can be, you know, so they may be looking mm -hmm. and, and our, you know, debt to GDP ratio is already at 63% before we did the recent bonds. Yes. You know, both Tesla and the sovereign. So that could also mean, <coughs> I mean, if you, if you advise not to borrow, that could also mean increasing uh, revenue well, generation. That, that could be uh, bringing in more taxes. No, the advice not to borrow is, um, let us look at it in our special circumstances. You show the table, if you are show the ratios, right, you mentioned compensation, it was very large. Yes, 26.5 billion. Yes, interest. Very billion. Yes, when you add those two, right, just like a condition we face at a point in single spine, it is taking 98.1 or 2 percent of tax revenue. Exactly. Yes. So the question is if that revenue falls, and remember we are talking about gross tax revenue, that is before the allocations are made because it includes oil revenue, which we should be low. Mm. Right. If we take out the ones going to get funds to DSCF and others, you know, um, if your revenues are going to fall more, then it means that interest payments which are statutory, right, and compensation which we often say is non-discretionary because you have to pay government workers, you know, is a payroll bloated. <clears throat> and those are the sort of questions that will be. Then it means that we may end up borrowing because if the, those two items go above 100%. Let's, let's give a particular example. If I have 1.2% and my loss of revenue to 1.8% left to run government and for capital expenditure, that's what 98.2% uh, 90, 90, means. Then if revenue is going to fall and it falls by, say, 2%, right, and I can't reduce my expenditure significantly, then my borrowing is going to start paying those two items. Okay, and that's why you say we. And must, so that's where the we yeah, must, that's where the we fund must consider re reducing our expenditure. You, is very you have to look but, at the but, but, but before we go for a break, also let's look at one other issue. Uh, you've talked about you know um, certain industries beginning to complain already. Of course, the Ghana Union of Traders Association has asked for even support. They've asked for a moratorium on loans from the banks. Uh, the hoteliers have uh, requested that. It would, they would need about 300 and uh, you know th about 300 million Ghana cities if they are to continue being in operation. Can government provide stimulus packages at it, this time? It would sound harsh, right? But I think sometimes being candid is very important, and that is the point I made. You know, the heading: no budget space for major, for major fiscal stimulus. So government you know, can't. Well, government would have to do something. Look, government is already doing But there's doing. no space, I, you say. No, yes, but, well, but this is where priorities come in. For example, government is already talking to pharmaceuticals. And that's what the IMF, for example, says, consider health expenditure and prioritize yeah, but, I mean, that. Looking at the tax but revenue, saying, for instance, and looking at non-tax revenue, if we add all of it together, you know the challenges we are faced with. Because we have to make payments, wages and uh, you know, compensation of employees, 26.5 billion, uh, interest payments, that is, that, I mean, you can't do anything about it. That is also 21 billion. Well, so the, the, one of the essence of, you know, what, you know, I wrote with Bobby here is to say, let's be realistic about the demands that we are making. You know, because I've heard, you know, um, what I believe as um, informed people who probably, you know, having maybe taken a 4.7 deficit and others, but remember if you adjust it, 
you know, then your deficit is going to be higher at 6.4, and that means that the budget deficit is already is high. And at 6. Point, you know, um, 6.5, I think it's 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 just what was yeah. yeah, it's just what was done in 2016, right? So and in so effect, so those making demands of government should be realistic in their demands also, because we don't have it. I'm just yes, um, we they are making demands of government, but there's a cost. There okay. will be a cost, you know, to those. Uh, the deficit could be higher. Is there space in the budget for this? No, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you how. No, I've already said. There's I think no I've space. Been, yeah, I've already said that there's no space for a, ma a major. It doesn't mean there's no space, you know, for doing nothing. We'll find out, right. we'll find out what that space will be when we return uh, from you know, this short break. And we'll also look at another major important issue because there are a lot of Ghanaians who are also calling on government to probably consider locking down uh, you know, the country. What would that mean for the Ghanaian economy? Can we actually support a lockdown? This is our front on Joy News. I'm Winston Lamo, and my guest is former Finance Minister Seth Tepe. We'll be right back after the break. It's clear that the measure we took to close our borders, ban international travel. And in the immediate aftermath of that banning, everybody who came to Ghana had to be subjected to mandatory quarantine as well as testing. At the time, there were a lot of comments, many of them unhelpful. But at the end of the day, I believe that the decision to ban international travel as well as to take the measures of quarantine and testing, are being vindicated by facts. It turns out that the overwhelming number of cases of, of, of the uh, confirmed in cases of infections that we have in there are all from people who, who came from abroad. And of those who came and have been quarantined, a large, I mean, an extreme number, some over 50 odd, have been found to, 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 to be carrying the virus. So uh, focusing on the importation of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the virus and the infection has proved to be absolutely spot on. And we are now uh, seeing the benefit of these measures. But we can never stop there. We have to constantly look at whatever additional measures are there that will put us in a strong place to deal with this. Whatever we do, people are talking now in Ghana about a lockdown, this and that. The majority of people who will be affected by decisions of that nature are the working people of our country, the ordinary people of Ghana. They are the ones who will be most affected. And it is important for us when we're taking these decisions to take into account their circumstances and conditions. You're going to lock down a crowd. What are the consequences? You're going to lock down the country. What are the consequences? Or particular areas of the country. A government, a responsible government, is required to look at all the implications before decisions are made. And that is the exercise on which we're currently engaged. And I'm hoping that much sooner than later we will come to an agreement within government of what those measures are, and then the Ghanaian people will be informed. So that's President Akufuado talking about, you know, listening to all Ghanaians and, you know, weighing the options and eventually settling on one. And so uh, lockdown is on the table, but is not something he's settled on now. So let's get into that particular conversation and find out, uh, you know, whether the Ghanaian economy can actually sustain a lockdown. I still have uh, former finance minister Seth Tekpe here with me. So let's look at the economics of a lockdown. You hear the president, he says, well, they're considering a wide range of options. Can the Ghanaian economy support a lockdown? I think we have to be realistic about this question. We are mm. a million, we are a developing country mm. transitioning to a middle income country. And the uh, I would say that it will be difficult. And the reason I, I say it will be difficult rather than answer the question directly by saying yes or no is that what if 
is a health necessity mm. and you don't do it now and then the problem worsens you may have a bigger economic situation on your hand and therefore um, you have to be making some preparation as has been ongoing and again going back to Ebola mm. remember we moved quickly and uh, there were economic consequences of setting up the emergency center if you remember yes but, but um, I mean the president makes a strategic I mean, he, he makes a very important point that if you were to lock down Accra a lot of people would be affected by this you know the Ghanaian economy very well having been finance minister you know what and you've talked about global perspectives you know what is being done in other jurisdictions what they have to <clears> do <throat> is to be providing packages stimulus packages which you have talked about as a country not being able to you know uh, a major package under the circumstance with about uh, you know 50 percent of Ghanaians, 45 to 50 percent of Ghanaians living on daily sustenance, as in having to work daily to make a living. Is it advisable to be considering this? We are talking about people's health. And so let me, let me, let me put my answer in this way. Mm -hmm. What if it happened? Then what? From the economic front. If you lack fiscal space, it means that lacking fiscal space means that you do not have the wherewithal <clears throat> to be able to do everything. If you are developing countries, you can't behave like America. You can't behave like sure. other, you know, they have buffers, they have, you know, low interest rates, so they could borrow at low interest rates. Today we cannot. And then, so one, it means that, yes, providing, you know, some relief, and that would increase expenditure. Which you say it we means it means well I'm I'm looking at the you know you the question you pose mm -hmm. and I'm giving okay. you know what it would mean mm. right it would mean also private sector and private even government institutions that generate revenue non tax revenue um, either the <coughs> lockdown of it means people are allowed to go and buy food and others I think it's no complaint. Um, skeletal staff with social distancing may be allowed, but you are not going to have economic activity at its, at its uh, fullest, right? And therefore, that means that you may also take a hit, more hit on the revenue exactly. side than... But the big question then, it would mean that if you do not, you cannot provide all this from your budget, then you have to borrow. And it means that we must be ready for a higher deficit and be ready, you know, for, uh, <coughs> we must be ready for a higher deficit and then we must also be ready for the debt, you know, uh, increasing, which could come at higher interest rates, could come, you know, difficult, considering that, as I said, we are 63, 64%, you know, even before we could add the first quarter borrowing. So I think that, Part of the education should <coughs> should involve not necessarily are we to do it or not to do it because what I know from my experience is that when health issues are concerned, as I said, as with Ebola, you have to make some money available mm -hmm. because that has become the priority. Health, you know, and so, and so, and so uh, yeah. in, in in times like these, you could actually go beyond the five percent fiscal deficit. Because we have, you know, uh, oh, a we are we are beyond five percent. So we are already beyond you, five percent. So you you would advise government. Let's accept that we are beyond five yeah, so percent. You, you are advising <coughs> government that when it becomes necessary, they should borrow to help the economy. No, I, I don't make that decision for government. No, but it's advice you're giving you. I mean, no, I've, I've, no, you you you've talked about the fact no, that it gets to a point where it no, will be no, important. I, to I make I make a point in studios. I don't want the headlines. September. No, 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 you don't need to repeat. My, I mean, it's okay, very clear. Yes, I, You've talked about the fact <coughs> that when it happens like I that. I prefer to tell Ghanaians the consequences. So, so you're telling Ghanaians that, that the government, when it happens like government no, will have to borrow? No, what I, wait, I don't have all the facts. The fact that I have been finance minister 
doesn't mean that I know what the Minister for Finance knows. So I can't tell him go and borrow. But I am telling Ghanaians that from what I know of advanced cash, from what I know from my experience, if the decision ends up you know, with a lockdown, and if the decision, then I think I owe the duty to say, under that scenario, you know, this is what we should expect. You know, and I think that education has to come. And that education yeah. is <coughs> under that scenario, we should expect government borrowing. I'm saying it's inevitable. If you are going to, if you are going to lock down, you don't have fiscal space. It's inevitable. That the consequences will be a, a higher deficit, and you must find some means. Unless, of course, the reliefs you are asking, you know, from the IMF, the World Bank, and others. Uh, because remember, some of the donor countries, another important point is that some of the donor countries that would have come to our aid are themselves going through critical crisis, you know, at this very moment. You know, and so you may not, you, you, you have to be very conservative in expecting, you know, those sources to be providing you with much support. And again, um, let, me, let me look forward a bit and, I, I, and, and say that for me, it is therefore important that we consider that when times are good, and especially if we are going to get a fourth oil field, as is probable, and maybe get, let us be circumspect okay. and not and plan for when times will be bad. And so <laughs> in these bad times, and with the but fact we that, did it. well, with the fact that uh, you know fiscal is already above the six, I mean the five percent, if it becomes necessary. I call for transparency. And, and we should I'm go saying, ahead. No, I'm, I call for transparency. Exactly. And I say that while, if you take, while, while you've called for transparency, if you took, no, if you you're take, speaking to Ghanaians and saying, yeah, but I, no, but I want Ghanaians to know. Mm -hmm. I want Ghanaians to know that if you take the conventional approach to calculating the deficit, the IMF agrees with positions some of us have held for a long time that the deficit was 7.17%. In both 2018 and 2019, it okay. wasn't 3.7, you know, and therefore 4 .7, that yes, yes. Mm. It, and it, and it's supposed to be 4.6.4, okay. 6.5 even Tepe. before this. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. So that's the tech former finance minister joining us here on Upfront on joining. My name is Winston Amadou. Have a good evening. Bye.